today's lecture is going to be about tumor immunology. So I'm sure you're asking the question, what does tumor immunology have to do with microbiology? And we're going to cover uh, some microorganisms that infect uh, humans actually serve as a precursor and a very strong risk factor for development of certain cancers uh, later in life. So we will discuss those cancers, but we'll also look at the similarities between tumor immunology and pathogen uh, immunology. So here we have a picture, a beautiful picture of a tumor that is surrounded by antibodies. And in this particular case, this is a functioning immune system that has clearly recognized this is a tumor and that the tumor is different from normal tissue and potentially the tumor will get eradicated by the antibodies. And, you know, one of the things that we'll discuss in the lecture is actually how uh, immunology or the immune system can be recruited, so to speak, to actually work towards uh, eradication of tumors, just like uh, the immune system eradicates uh, organisms. So um, to introduce uh, the lecture for today, we're gonna talk about different viruses and bacteria that infect the organism or infect humans and in doing so actually become a very strong risk factor for development of future cancers. So one of the most well-known uh, examples of that is the human papilloma virus. And we discussed in the virology lectures that the human papillomavirus is uh, a necessary cause to all cervical cancer in women and anal cancer in men. So that when women are infected with, for instance, uh, human papillomavirus, they're actually at increased risk for uh, cervical cancer. And then, which is the real, uh, reason that we're promoting uh, Gardasil, which is the name of the vaccine for uh, human papillomavirus, to prevent women from developing cervical cancer. Now, hepatitis B is another virus that uh, when you're when one is infected with hepatitis B, the risk of future development of of liver cancer is greatly elevated. Hepatitis B is an infection of the liver, and it sends, sets the ground work basically for development of future liver cancer. Now Helicobacter pylori is a bacteria. It's a stomach, it's a bacteria that lives uh, inside of the stomach. And Helicobacter pylori used to be, uh, well, it actually infects uh, over two thirds of the world's population has been infected with the Helicobacter pylori ba uh, bacteria. And, um, Oh, gosh, about 30 or 40 years ago, uh, the, the incidence of ulcers, so development of an ulcer used to be thought of as purely due to stress, but it was determined that the ulcers are in the stomach are actually caused by Helicobacter pylori. So there was a famous study where they put folks who had, uh, uh, who were at risk of developing uh, ulcers on an antibiotic, and lo and behold, their ulcers uh, healed, but it was also determined that Helicobacter pylori is a very strong risk factor for development of future gastric cancer. So basically, two thirds of the world, because of being uh, infected by Helicobacter pylori, is at risk for future development of gastric cancer. So the other part, the other aspect of immunology that is important in relationship to tumors is that uh, the immune system can be recruited in relationship to actually uh, treating tumors. So today we're gonna focus on uh, the theory of immune surveillance. So how does the immune system, or another way of saying it, does the immune system, uh, or is the immune system able to identify tumors? What are the transformations that occur in tumors? Uh, how do uh, how does the immune system react to tumors? What are the particular aspects of tumors that might promote a an immune response? What are the different therapies that utilize the immune system? And how is inflammation related to the development of cancer? So the immune surveillance theory has to do with 
does or is the immune system capable of identifying uh, cancer cells? And if so, can the immune system actually eradicate a cancer? So if um, the immune system uh, by definition is impaired, so folks who were immune suppressed due to medication, for instance, these individuals are also at high risk for development of certain cancers. So the question or the statement really is, if the immune system is impaired, can we expect to see more cancers and will then the cancer cells escape detection? So what are some specific examples and ways in which tumors escape detection? Well, the amount of the antigen uh, expressed by the tumor is too low to be recognized by the immune system. Uh, the tumor itself sheds antigens that block antibodies or, or target antibodies. So the antibodies target the release protein, but not the tumor. And, or the tumor doesn't express immunogenic antigens at all. It completely uh, resembles a normal cell. And, you know, early stages of cancers do look very normal, and so they can conceivably escape detection. Now, also, the tumor does not express uh, major histocompatibility complex antigens, and these are antigens that are designed to help the body distinguish uh, foreign tissue from uh, tissue that belongs to the body. And the tumor itself may secrete factors that actually act to uh, suppress the immune system. Also, some tumors are so rapid in development uh, that they completely overtake the immune system. Now, some very late stage tumors uh, function in this way. So the thing that we know, for instance, about cancer is that cancer basically is uncontrolled growth. And the, the processes in which the human body uh, regulates growth, are, are those processes are lost, and then we get complete, complete loss of regulation, and then we get very uh, fast uh, and unchecked proliferation. Uh, so, you know, usually in the normal body, we have very careful regulation of uh, the growth of normal cells. And so a prime example of that is, say, for instance, when one gets injured, you get a, a cut or a scrape on your arm or something, and then the body naturally uh, detects that there's a wound, and the whole healing process is such where these cells actually replicate and they replace the injured tissue, and when they've completely replaced the tissue, the growth stops. But in cancer, that stopping doesn't happen. The growth just continues. So one way that you can lose this uh, growth regulation is having these cells exposed to chemicals, for instance, irradiation. We saw some of the viruses that can cause uh, these mutagenic changes. And, you know, when this happens, then the, the normal factors that regulate growth are lost. So some of the mutations that can happen in terms of this growth dysregulation are um, these uh, genes called oncogenes, which are cancer growth promoting genes. So in this process where we lose this regulation, we can actually cause these genes to increase in activity. So produce proteins, for instance, that promote uh, cell replication. And the other thing that can happen is that we can suppress or downregulate the mechanisms that actually stop growth. So those the genes that uh, work towards suppressing or stopping growth, those are called tumor suppressor genes. So when we downregulate, when we suppress those stopping mechanisms, then the growth can be uh, very dysregulated. So here is a very rapidly growing tumor. And you can see uh, in this part of growth that quite a lot of growth happens before we even know, before it's clinically detected. So 
Uh, what does that mean? Well, that means perhaps getting a mammogram and, and seeing a dense area of the breast uh, demonstrating that there's a, uh, there's a tumor there. Now, now, some tumors grow so quickly. So, you know, some women are asked to come in every six months even to get a mammogram. And so you can have a tumor appear uh, that wasn't seen uh, six months prior, for instance. So once a tumor reaches that clinically detectable state, it's pretty far gone. And so in this particular case, it's very, it's not that far away from becoming so large as a tumor, uh, it then is lethal. So this is just a picture of how potentially quickly that growth can occur. So a malignant, so then you ask, well, what is a malignant t tumor? What's a benign tumor? And how, and when does that transformation happen from benign to malignant? Well, if you think of, say, this is a, a area, this is a, a, a vessel, you know, could be in the breast. And most, uh, most organs, uh, most tissues are surrounded by a basement membrane. So if this is the basement membrane of a particular organ, um, when we have benign, a benign tumor is where we have dysregulated cancer growth, but those cells, those cancerous cells, just stay within the ba basement membrane. There isn't any uh, escape from that membrane. But in a malignant tumor, we actually have a break in the basement membrane, and then we have these cancer cells growing outside the basement membrane. So when that happens, then the tumor is called malignant. So benign tumors are tumors that do not have indefinite growth. There's growth, but then the growth stops. And in this case, it's contained within the basement membrane. The other name of that, some other tumors, they're often called in situ tumors as well. So in this case, when the tumor, when the cancer cells actually invade the basement membrane and grow outside the basement membrane, that tumor is called malignant. And potentially with malignant tumors, there is indefinite growth so that there is continual growth and we can even have migration to other tissue. Um, so this progression of benign to malignant can occur. Now, some tumors just stay in the benign state. They never progress to malignancy. Some tumors start benign, start out benign, and then progress to malignancy. So one of the discovery areas that need, that is being worked on in cancer research is, can we predict which tumors are going to stay benign and which are going to become malignant? And at this point, in some cases, we really can't yet do that. So in this transitional state, there are various changes that occur. And one of them was what I showed, which is growing outside of that basement membrane. So once the tumor reaches this malignant state, there's rapid growth rate, there's infiltration to other, other tissues, there's metastasis where you have uh, migration of the cancer cells to other tissues, and then you have poor survival. So carcinogenesis is the process by which cells become uh, malignant, or they actually, the process by which neoplasia uh, is, is developed. Neoplasia is another word for cancer. So carcinogenesis is the process by which we get cancer malignancy. It's ultimately carcinogenesis is caused by genetic mutation. And most of the time that takes 20 or 30 years to develop. So in our examples of the infectious agents, often those infections occur at a younger age, and then 20 or 30 years later, we get the cancer. So in this particular model of carcinogenesis, we have what's called initiation, where we induce a genetic change in the cell then we get those genetic changes promoted in terms of cell replication. And then uh, we get dedifferentiation uh, over time, which means that the cells become more and more uh, abnormal. 
So these are examples of and what it looks like in terms of malignant transformation. So as you go in this direction, you become more abnormal. And so here, I'll draw it on this side as well. Uh, so here we have a large number of, of dividing cells. So this is the beginning stages of transformation. And then we start seeing uh, abnormal nuclei. And then the nuclei become larger. Then they become the actual cells vary in terms of size and shape. Then we start losing normal uh, cell function we get a disorganized arrangement and then this is where we get a poorly defined tumor boundary where we actually get growth of cells outside the basement membrane. So what is what about identification of these tumors by the immune system? One way is through these tumor antigens. Now remember antigens is the particular kind of protein configuration, but they don't have to be protein. They can be other kinds of molecules that have particular shapes that uh, serve to identify to the immune system that they're foreign. So in order for the immune system to react to a tumor, the tumor must express antigens that the immune system recognizes are foreign. That's very important. So the the immune system needs to see that that tumor is not a normal part or a normal part of the body and that tumor is not normal tissue. So a growing tumor is secretes, a lot of these growing tumors secrete chemical signals that serve to change gene expression and some of these changes uh, actually change. We, we saw earlier they could even suppress uh, the immune response, and uh, these these gene expression changes uh, change immune re reactivity to tumors. They potentially can make the immune system more sensitive to these tumor antigens, and the, these aspects of the antigen uh, antibody recognition can be utilized in terms of tumor immunotherapy. Uh, so the tumor antigens again are, um, so the gene expression here is leading to, um, also that it leads to changes in cell receptors. So that the receptors, for instance, on the tumor can, can change, uh, and they can change in terms of configuration and shape. So receptors that regulate cell cycle and cell death. So for instance, we can have a situation where a tumor that used to be able to uh, signal to the immune system that it was foreign, that these substances are secreted, and then the tumor is no longer see being seen as abnormal. And sometimes that's done by blocking receptors, and sometimes the tumor is able to suppress the mechanisms that would actually cause the cell to die or to go through apoptosis. So these receptors all play critical roles in relationship to signal uh, transduction pathways. So the tumors, just like the bacteria, are very clever in terms of tricking the immune system or suppressing the immune system and enabling the tumor uh, to survive. So uh, there's an increase, and we talked about this earlier in the lecture, there's an increase in cancer among individuals that have uh, immune suppression or for because of their disease or because of their treatment, various aspects of the immune system are suppressed and that capacity to recognize tumors is lost. So one uh, very uh, common or important example are individuals who have HIV and AIDS. These individuals are at very high risk for developing Kaposi sarcoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is an actual cancer of the immune system. Now, Kaposi sarcoma is a type of skin cancer that used to be very rare before the onset of HIV and AIDS. And in fact, in the early days of the AIDS epidemic, uh, Kaposi sarcoma was actually a sign that the individual was infected with the AIDS virus. 
So transplant patients, uh, by definition, need to take these immune suppressing drugs so that the uh, immune system doesn't recognize their transplanted organ as being foreign. They are at risk for developing quite a few cancers. So non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, lung cancer, liver cancer, and kidney cancer. Now the Epstein-Barr virus, that particular virus uh, increases the risk for uh, liver cancer. And malaria, which is uh, a, a parasitic uh, infection, actually increases the risk of Burkitt's lymphoma in Africa. And it also increases the risk of brain cancer in the United States. So other forms of tumor immu immunotherapies that are actually used in uh, today's uh, treatment oncology wards uh, there are two different uh, groupings of therapies. There's active therapy and passive therapy. Now, active therapy is where the host themselves per, per make uh, particular immune response cells. So sometimes you can prompt uh, the individual who has the cancer to produce uh, uh, immune responses to the tumor. You can do that by activating the macrophages, which are a particular kind of immune cells. Uh, that can kill tumors, but also this concept of vaccination is really important because if we can vaccinate these young uh, adolescent girls and boys uh, with Gardasil in terms of then we prevent them from getting HPV. And if they don't have HPV, their chances for developing uh, cervical cancer and anal cancer are much, much lower. So that's a way to prevent future cancer. Also, the hepatitis B vaccine is a way to prevent liver cancer, for instance. Now, there are other types of therapies that are considered passive, and that's where you actually directly uh, inject uh, immune cells to fight off a particular tumor. Uh, these can be antibodies and B and T cells that you inject directly, so these immunoglobulin type of therapies, for instance. A really good example is uh, breast cancer, that some women who are diagnosed with breast cancer have a particular marker on their tumors, this HER2 new marker, and uh, they've developed this antibody treatment called Herceptin. Actually, it was a Dennis Slayman at UCLA developed it. And it's basically an antibody treatment for these HER2 new markers that are on these on the breast tumors. Now, not all women are HER2 new positive, but quite a sizable percentage are. And this particular antibody-based drug is very, it targets actually the tumors of the women who have breast cancer. And these tumors have this HER2 new marker and, and they're actually called, uh, their tumors are called HER2 new positive. So we have other uh, newer examples of different types of cancer treatments that involve immune uh, responses where we actually have, we've developed antibodies to particular tumors that are very specific to that tumor and attached to the antibody is a chemotherapy drug. And the chemotherapy drug is you know, basically bonded or bound to the antibody. So when the antibody targets itself to the tumor, it brings along the chemotherapy drug, and then the chemotherapy drug is directly targeted to the tumor and not to the normal tissue, the normal healthy tissue, for instance. So the other, the last concept we're going to talk about is inflammation and cancer. Now there are some conditions in the body that actually promote uh, what's called chronic inflammation, and that's when the inflammatory process of immunity, instead of stopping after the wound is healed, for instance, there continues to be a an immune response, and that continued immune response can actually function to suppress uh, the acquired uh, B cell and T cell functions so that when a tumor develops, the immune system is less capable 
of distinguishing that tumor as being foreign. So when we have this uh, chronic inflammation, we have a situation where we get this pro-inflammatory cytokine release from inflammatory cells, we get these free radicals, we have oxidative stress, we have promotion of mutations, and we have a decreased ability to respond to DNA damage. And this milieu, this chronic inflammatory milieu, actually promotes the development of cancer cells. Uh, also, though, we can have inflammation as a response to cancer, and sometimes that actually is deleterious to the healing process, and that the cancer cells themselves induce an inflammatory process. And uh, so sometimes, for instance, we can even tell, we can even detect that there's a cancer by measuring some of these inflammatory response molecules like the C-reactive protein or IL-6, for instance, in breast cancer. So we also have a situation where chronic inflammation can actually change the relationship that the bacteria have in relationship to the human body. So in our digestive tracts, for instance, are multiple species of bacteria that live in a, what's called a symbiotic or commensal fashion where the immune system does not recognize these bacteria as being foreign, and they just live just fine in the digestive tract, and they secrete substances, and they help to digest food, and they're quite beneficial to the organism. But with this chronic inflammation, the it's almost like the immune system forgets the relationship, you know, forgets that these bacteria are friendly. And so it leads to what's called a dysymbiosis. So that friendship is broken, so to speak. And then we can get uh, an expansion of this bacteria. And also the bacteria itself can, can secrete toxins. And then the immune system will react to those toxins. So then we'll get a whole inflammatory reaction. We have DNA damage. We have, uh, again, toxins released by the bacteria themselves. And so we can actually injure the tissue. And if that occurs over a long period of time, we can actually uh, progress to cancer in that way as well. This was a, a recent paper that appeared a couple of years ago in Science. Uh, so that concludes our discussion. So let's uh, evaluate the answers to these uh, examples. So what cancers, so this might be a question you're going to get on your immunology exam or even your microbiology exam. What cancers result from what vi um, viral and bacterial infections? So remember, we had some very important examples. We had HPV. Okay, and then we had hepatitis B. So the best way to think about these uh, pathogens is to remember what tissue they infect. And, and invariably, that's the same tissue where the cancer develops. So we have hepat uh, HPV, we have hepatitis B, and then we have H. pylori. Okay, so HPV infects the, uh, you know, genital tract. Okay, and then eventually that will lead to uh, cervical cancer. Okay, uh, hepatitis B infects the liver, and that will eventually lead to liver cancer. And H. pylori affects the stomach, which will eventually increase the risk for gastric cancer. So the real key is just to remember the tissues that these particular organisms infect originally. So name several ways that tumors escape immune detection. So remember, one of the ways was there were a low level of antigens produced by the tumor. Another way was there were no antigens, okay? So this, this could represent an early 
stage cancer, for instance. Okay, and, and the other ex uh, main example was that the tumor secretes, um, you know, tumor or immune suppression factors. And the other one that's not really related to the tumor is in the condition of generalized immune suppression through drugs or disease. Okay, so our next example are what are some of the ways that cancer is related to inflammation? So remember, we can have inflammation leads to cancer, and we can have cancer produces inflammation, and that that inflammation can serve to actually uh, worsen the prognosis of the cancer. It, it may not necessarily benefit the cancer. It may make it worse. And here we can have chronic inflammation from some other reason, like obesity, for instance. Individuals who are obese have pro-inflammatory conditions or some other diseases that promote inflammation. And over time, that can serve as a ground or a, a framework or a, a growth promotion type of environment for uh, cancer cells to develop. So the last example, how can we target tumors immunologically? So this is a uh, area that has been receiving a lot of attention recently uh, in cancer. So they're even doing something, they're even doing things where they're injecting uh, tumors with certain benign viruses, for instance, and then the immune system recognizes the viruses as being foreign, and then the immune system eradicates the viruses, and then they end up eradicating the tumor. Now, we also have what we discussed, which is the Herceptin example, where we actually have developed an antibody to a particular uh, marker on a breast cancer tumor. And that particular marker, that, those, that antibody treatment is targeted to those particular markers that are on the breast cancer uh, tumor. And then we have antibodies that are attached to a chemotherapy drug and that those antibodies can target themselves or can be developed in terms of being targeted to a particular tumor and then the antibody comes along with the chemotherapy and then the chemotherapy is directly targeted the tumor and not uh, the normal uh, tissue. So that concludes our discussion for today. Thank you so much for visiting educator.com.